All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming, and and thank you to to the bank for inviting me. And uh, and uh, yeah. So please stop me at any time if you if you have questions. I, I and I'll, I'll try to leave plenty of room at the end to have a discussion too. Uh, uh, and uh, and as a, as a Ernesto was saying, this is don't work with Chris Wolf, who is at Chicago now, and will be joining MIT uh, next year. All right. So the starting point of this paper is is kind of a you know some. All, relatively all idea comes from basic consumer theory going back to at least Mankiw 1982, even before that Hayashi has a paper on this, and, uh, and the idea that, that the pent-up demand tends to be stronger for more durable goods. And uh, so this is the, the idea that, for instance, if you have a, a consumer in a recession that stops buying a car, a durable good, then that is a type of purchase that is typically just postponed for later on during the recovery when, when incomes rise and, and, and things get better. Uh, whereas this type of pent up demand tends to be weaker or even absent for, for services and, and non durable goods. So if you think about the same consumer that stops getting a haircut or going out for a meal uh, in a restaurant, then that is the type of consumption that is li unlikely to be fully compensated. Uh, uh, all the expenditures lost are, are, are unlikely to be fully compensated later on during the, the recovery. And, uh, and what we're gonna ask in this paper is that if we have this, this logic of pent up demand, this mechanism in place, then what does this imply for how differences in the composition of spending across recession affect the, the strength of recoveries? And, uh, and we're gonna think about two reasons why this variation across recessions in the spending composition may take place. The first one being that maybe across countries over and over the, in the same country over long periods of time, the expenditure shares across durables and service and non-durables may be different. One reason being structural factors, structural transformation and the like. And, and the second one being that even within the same country, some recessions may be driven by some shocks that are more sectoral in nature, more biased towards services or, or, or durables. And the current, I guess, the current COVID uh, recession is one stark example of a very services biased uh, a recession compared to, to the average. Um, and uh, so then what we're gonna do in the paper is start by formalizing this idea of pent-up demand in a multi-sector model with uh, durables and services and undurables and, uh, and demand determined output plus a number of demand shocks that are gonna be the drivers of, of cycles. And, uh, and we're going to derive a, a testable condition for that guarantees that pent up demand effects are present and, and strong enough, and uh, which may not always be the case. And then we're going to show the main result, theoretical result, that when this condition holds, then recoveries from recessions that are more concentrated in services will tend to be weaker than recoveries from recessions that are more biased towards uh, towards durables, precisely because pent up, de pent -up demand effects are going to be weaker in the former compared to the to the latter, and um, and and this is regardless of whether the variation in, in composition is due to long run shares or or the sectoral shock incidence. And uh, so, having shown this, then we're going to actually go to the data and try to and test this this key condition uh, using aggregate time series evidence for the for the U.S. and we're going to find very strong support for it. Just to give away what the condition is, it's going to be a condition on the input responses to aggregate demand shocks and, and how you rank them in terms of the services responses and, and the responses. And, uh, and we're going to find that, that that condition holds. Then we're going to go beyond this simple qualitative result and, and try to actually ask, well, for the type of variation that we have observed across countries and across recessions in demand composition, does that have a quantitatively important effect on on the strength of the of the recovery? And the answer is going to be that uh, is going to be yes. And uh, in particular for something like the COVID nineteen recession. And and in light of these uh, this this magnitudes that we find, then we're going to end by discussing some implications for optimal monetary policy when thinking about countries that become more services intensive or recessions that are more uh, services biased. And, uh, so that's the plan. And uh, if you have any questions, the I'm happy to take them now. Uh, Martin, oh, this is Federico. Oh, Sorry. Yep. go ahead. Can... Okay, thanks, Fer. Uh, and yes, just, just one curiosity, if I understood this correctly. 
if, if the same demand shock affect two different countries, so they have the same shock, for instance, but these two countries are in different parts of the development. So one is more concentrated in, in manufacturing and the other is more developed and now the economy is in services. This means that the, 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 that, that the same shock will be will, will affect more the, the country that is now more concentrated in manufacturing. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I know. So, so that's the, the nature of the exercise that one of the main exercises I'm going to do is, is that one, in fact. And, uh, but it's always going to be, so once you change the service, the, the shares, expanded shares, there's both going to be a change in the amplification of the shock of the recession and a change in the persistence of the, of the recovery. And all the exercises that I'm going to show you, I'm always going to be thinking about what happens for a given scale of the recession, say a 1% drop in output, how does the change in the share affect the, the subsequent recovery? But that's the, the nature of the exercise. That's one of them, the, the one that I call one here. Uh, Martin, this is Federico. Um, yeah. do, w will you discuss something about fiscal uh, policy? I guess that would be kind of a natural also application in terms of thinking about optimal policy response. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm not, unfortunately, but but we can have that discussion at the end, maybe. Like, I think I okay. mean, at the end of the day, it, to the extent that you could reproduce monetary policy with, with some transfers and whatnot, so I would say the same, some of the same intuitions may apply. But, yeah. Okay, good. Um, so, so yeah. So, in terms of the literature, the I think this fits in the paper fits into three literatures. The first one, huge literature on sectoral heterogeneity and business cycle dynamics, and of course, a lot of work on on durables and and dynamics. Uh, uh, they are like Manki, Caballero, Berger, Abra. And let me mention two papers that are related to some of the empirics that I'm going to show you, which are Ersegan, Levine, and and Mackay and Brillan, who have some evidence of, of the type of input responses that, that I'm going to show you uh, to monetary policy shocks. Um, then there's a, there's a literature on heterogeneity on the supply side, whereas I guess this paper is kind of heterogeneity on the demand side. And, uh, and on the supply side, you know, people have studied heterogeneity nominal rigidities, networks, networks plus nominal rigidities, like you know, Ernesto's paper, sometimes doing optimal policy like Lao and, and, and Tavas Salehi. And uh, so I would say, you know, we are looking at, it's complementary to this literature. It's, it's just another type of heterogeneity, uh, in terms of, but also emphasizing the, the uh, uh, sectoral heterogeneity. And uh, then there's a, a pretty big literature to do on the strength and, and shape of recoveries. Uh, sometimes thinking about structural forces, like in FQ, in Nakamura and Tyson, uh, we'll have something to say about that. Sometimes thinking about the nature of shocks, for instance, like my paper, on, on regional business cycles, and uh, and uh, and hence, and, you know, the two exercises I'm going to show you are related to this. And then finally, of course, the, one of the applications is to the COVID-19 recession. And uh, and, and here, there's actually a very nice paper by by Victoria Gregory and Guido Mencio thinking about the shape of recoveries. You may have followed these discussions uh, online on whether the recovery is going to be like V-shape, ABC shape, uh, J, or whatever. And, uh, and we'll have something to say uh, about that too. Uh, okay. So you may ask theory? a couple of, sorry, yeah. may I ask a couple of things about uh, the chat review? Uh, yeah, of course. I am Ernesto here. So very quick. One, uh, linked to Federico's question, there is this paper uh, by Christophe Bohem, uh, I think in the JME or something, about the composition of government spending uh, tilted to, towards um, durables. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the effect of, of fiscal shocks. Uh, that sounds a little bit familiar to, to at least in, in abstract from what, what you're doing. Yes. And the second thing is about the McKay Villan uh, paper. I remember I've seen this paper and, and there is a big discussion there about the ham shape response of durables in the data versus the mm -hmm. front loading that all models can get. Are you going to mm -hmm. tell us something about that? A bit, yes. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll tell you. I'll, I'll talk about that ham shapedness uh, a, a bit, and then I'll also talk about the how things change when you think not about the risk, having durables as a mechanism and pent up demand. How things change when you're thinking about the transmission of monetary policy, and just how it amplifies or or uh, or or induces more or less persistence for a, for monetary policy shock. 
versus thinking about optimal monetary policy when you have durables, and they turn out to be the the there's a stark difference between the two. That's actually the main takeaway of the of the optimal policy discussion. So I'll get okay. that. Great, thank you. Good. Um, okay. Good. So the theory is going to be a textbook mutation model with multiple sectors, and uh, uh, in the baseline, we're just going to have a representative household that consumes durables and services. Here, services just think about services and non-durables interchange interchangeably. I'm not going to make a distinction between those two. And uh, and then the rest of the economy, is gonna, there's going to be uh, firms producing intermediates using labor only, and then. Uh, and uh, these intermediates are going to go into the production of durables and, and services. And then uh, one assumption that we're going to make is that labor can be fully uh, transferred across the two, the, the two production technologies. And this is going to imply that the relative price of durables and services is, is fixed. So it was one. And um, and uh, you're doing this per, first for tractability, but also because empirically, People have not really documented these large changes in relative prices over the cycle in response to some shocks. For instance, McKay and Wieland have that. House and Basu uh, have that. And um, and uh, so so yeah, we're gonna go with that. And uh, then uh, we're gonna assume that there are nominal rigidities in price and wage setting in a la calvo most of the time, and then the, the the nominal rate is set by the monetary authority. And then uh, finally, there's going to be only three shocks in the economy. There's going to be a shock that we're, we're going to call aggregate demand B, and then two sectoral demand shocks that are going to change the the demands for durables and and services or, or non-durables. Okay. Hello. That's it. Yep. Hey, can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. Hi, it's Paula here from uh, Rigspunk. I was wondering about uh, different sectors and the labor in different sectors. Do you have any specific um, yeah, features? People can move from sectors to sectors. Since you are talking about sectors, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. So the uh, the assumption is that free labor is homogeneous and it's pretty pretty mobile across the two. So there's no. It's really boring the model in that respect. There's no. Which you think in reality could be in fact important that people uh kind of move that freely and that's uh, that's what it would introduce is maybe something that i think it may be very relevant in reality sometimes uh the some terms of like capacity constraints in how fast you can ramp up production in a sector that needs to that needs to expand uh and uh and i'll talk i'll talk a bit about that once we how we change some of the results but i we don't have that in in, in the model and uh okay. thanks think, just to be clear yes um, this is, I mean, honestly, I think this is an, something that I find puzzling when I look at these input responses in the data of durables and services, the prices of them, which is you would expect that given that durables demand is much more volatile, that something like that would transfer to prices as well. And it doesn't seem to be the case, at least at you know, kind of an aggregated level. And uh, I have some conjectures for why that may be the case, but not really, no, not. Uh, 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 no, I, I don't know, honestly. So I find that, you know, if anyone has ideas, I'm happy to, to discuss them. And have you looked at this in, in, in the, in the, in the current prices where the, that, that holds also now? I have not. No, I don't know that. Um, yeah. Okay. So that's the, that's the setup. Let me uh, elaborate a bit on the, on the household side, which is where really all the, the action is, is coming from. Um, so the household is going to have. Uh, preference over services, durables, and and labor or leisure, and uh, and the, it's going to be this CS form with a constant elasticity and also intertemporal elasticity of substitution for the bundle. And uh, crucially, we're going to assume that the three shocks that I introduced enter in the following way. There's going to be this BC business that is an aggregate demand shifter that's going to affect both the utility of services and the utility of of, of durables. And uh, and when I construct uh, this shock, and this sorry, and this is gonna have inter typical interpretation of something that is like an increasing uncertainty in the economy, an increasing idiosyncratic risk on income, deleveraging, and and whatnot. And uh, and we're gonna construct it in a way such that it has no real effect in a flexible price equilibrium. So that, in a sense, this is the natural expansion of the notion of aggregate demand to a multi-sector economy. If you have one sector alone, this is something that I didn't know. 
kind of a technical point. If you have only one sector, then this shock and a discount factor shock are identical. And uh, whereas they just change the inter you know the intertemporal, it's it's like an intertemporal wedge in intertemporal uh, Euler equations. But uh, but when you have multi-sector a multi-sector model, if you just introduce a discount factor shock, this may have real effects even in a flexible price uh, economy. And I, if we want to call this shock aggregate demand, which I, I want, and uh, then uh, then you need to do a bit something else, and and this is how you this is how you do it. And so that's in the paper. Yeah. Um, and by the way, this shocks this shock also is going to affect the the marginal utility of labor, so that then in equilibrium there's no this would introduce an additional channel in a, in partially sticky price economies where. Uh, so if we didn't have that, we have an additional channel where it's also shifting the labor supply directly. I don't, I, we, we want to abstract from that channel completely and just change in the temporal conditions. And uh, so, yeah, so that's uh, on a technical note what this aggregate demand shifter is. Uh, the sectoral demand shifters on the other hand, they're similar, but instead of affecting the utility of both, the sectoral demand shifter of services affect services and the sectoral demand uh, shock for durables affect the durables uh, utility. And uh, one interpretation of this, for instance, of the services one, is that this is people being afraid of uh, getting infected when consuming services and uh, going to a restaurant and whatnot. And hence, uh, they, 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 there's a disutility term uh, there. And, um, and we're going to, again, construct it in a way such that if they were equal, so the, if they were symmetric across the two sectors, the realization, then they would behave exactly like a common aggregate dimension. And, uh, uh, so, so, yeah, so three shocks, three shocks to to be able to 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 match different to to shift the spending opposition of the economy uh, in different ways. Okay. And, Very quick uh, on, on that. Uh, yep. This is Ernesto. Um, but also, as you uh, highlighted, it's also going to affect uh, labor supply. Not the way we constructed them. Yeah. So the, okay. that's, the that's the key thing. Of course, in the sorry, sorry, sorry. In general, equilibrium we will. Yeah, there's going to be production, yes. and production is going to be equal to employment, and so and consumption, and hence it's going to be affected. But it's not going to shift uh, directly the desire to consume versus work. The, okay. the, these coefficients here, I think, I mean, in the fixed price economy, which I'm going to show you in a second, this is relevant. But in the potential, in the when you have partially sticky prices, that's relevant. I never found that channel to be particularly. Plausible, mm -hmm. so we wanted to abstract yeah. from, from that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks. Um, uh, okay, so then the, on, it, what's the difference between durables and services then? Well, it's literally this delta term over here. So a service or a non-durable is just a good what that you buy and uh, and you consume and then it fully depreciates uh, instantaneously. A durable instead, you buy once and then you get a flow of consumption from that durable good that depreciates at rate delta, unless you replenish it. You replenish the stock by, by adding to the durable stock. And this is the, the difference between those two things is the, the expenditures in durables. And, uh, and then we're also going to allow for, for uh, uh, adjustment costs on durables. That's another difference with the services. And, uh, and uh, in this case, they're quadratic. We're going to allow for more general things later on. And this, Ernesto, by the way, will relate to the discussion of uh, with uh, McKay and Villa and, and, and the ham shapeness of the response or, or not. I'll come back to it. Uh, okay, questions about this? When, when you talked at the beginning about, um, and, and I guess also related to Luciano's question, sorry, this is Federico. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I thought you were, I mean, you said something about structural transformation. So I thought you were going to have some sort of like non homotopicities in the demand. Ah, yeah, uh, no, uh, structure. So, no, so, so all. And, that, and, 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 and I guess like adding that, I don't, I don't know, I just want to see your reactions to, uh, to sort of if you add that, uh, 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 that dimension, how would that change? Because it seems important if you want to distinguish. That. So it's going to be more boring than that. So if you see these five business over here, that's going to govern what's the long run shares of yeah. uh, expenditures. I'm going to be shifting those those things and uh, to do the, the comparison. So there's not going to be any non homotheses or anything like that. To the extent that those do not interact over the cycle, I think the exercise is 
is fine. Now, to the extent that having a non-homotopicity over long periods of time also has an effect on the non-homotopicity, how they affect things over the cycle, then the exercise will not be, will not be the same. And, uh, yeah. okay. and um, that would add an additional effect, which is that in a recession, if you shift, for instance, if services were a luxury, then in your recession, you would go away, even for an agony demand shock, let's say you would go away from services endogenously, not because yeah. the shock was different. And, uh, yeah. uh, but maybe it's just a, re then it's just a reinterpretation of like this reduced from shock. Maybe what it's trying to capture too is some form of non homotopicity. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. But I guess it wouldn't be sort of endogenously responding. It would not be to endogenously the original responding. shock. So that would be correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, that would be an additional channel. I think it's interesting. Uh, there's some papers on kind of like quality adjustment over the cycle and the light that, that may look something that it rely on no homotopicities. It will be an additional reason for why you would have, even for very uh, kind of like symmetric shocks, changes in demand composition over the cycle. And uh, be, you'd be interested to look at that too, actually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. Okay. Um, okay, good. All right, so I'm going to start with a, a very boring, not boring, but very special case of the model where I think all the intuition is there. So the, the special case is going to be one where there's separability bet the, between the durables and, and services. There's no adjustment cost, prices are fixed, and all shocks are ID. So one period shock, then come back to steady state, and, uh, so, and, and that's it. And, uh, and in this world, then output is going to be fully demand determined by the expenditure in services and expenditures in durables. And uh, okay, and this is actually one of the differences between the, stat the more older models like MANQ and Cavallero that were partial equilibrium where they were just studying the, how it, an income shock affects the consumption responses of this, each of these type of goods. And here is gonna be, the income is gonna be endogenous and, and the lens uh, is gonna, the, the consumption is going to affect income, and then income is going to affect consumption in their equity. Um, and and the, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the responses of each of these uh, three shocks, and then uh, at each in each case we're going to always focus on the recovery dynamics and the shape of the input responses. But the nature of the exercise is going to be to fix the severity of the recession, so the scale of the of the of the input response. And the reason we want to do that is because this is well understood already. So a lot of the literature has focused on how, when you have durables, because they're more intertemporal substitutable, then that generates larger amplification of any given shock. That's something about the risk vol volatility in the in the responses on impact. And so what we're going to do is fix that and instead focus on a different aspect of the responses, which is the the shape and how strong the reversal is or what the persistence is fixing say 1% recession. And uh, so that's, that's, that's just uh, and, and this is what we're going to focus on, on, on how pent up demand affects that. Uh, okay. And uh, all right, so let's, let's start with uh, uh, an economy that is only subject to a services demand shock, a negative one in this case. And these are the responses of services, durables and output. So this economy behaves, this is a one period shock and uh, it behaves exactly like a dur non durables only economy that you may have seen, very simple one. So services expenditures collapse by 1%, then go back to steady state the next period, and that's it. Given that I have separability and fixed prices, there's no response whatsoever in, in the durable sector. And then given that output is fully demand determined, then output just follows the same uh, in V shape input response that, that services do. So this is an economy where there's nothing that even looks like pent up demand and where the lost output during the recession, this one minus 1%, 1 it just simply forgot. There's a change minus one and then that's it. You go back to steady state, you never recover that. That, that, that output, that flow of output that, 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 was, that was lost. And uh, so then in this world, we're gonna define, in, and in general, we can define an object that is gonna measure how weak is the reversal of output over the whole cycle. And, and is this cumulative input response of output, the numerator, normalized by the, by the impact response, which in this case is always going to be minus one uh, by, by construction. And, uh, and we're always going to say, when I was talking about the strength of recoveries and whatnot, well, I'm always going to say that whenever this object is smaller, 
so that there's more lo more lost output over the cycle relative to the uh, to the the severity of the recession, then the recovery is going to be stronger, and, uh, and precisely because the reversal is going to be weaker. So maybe the example helps in in, in 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 thinking about what this object is. So this is a case where you it, the input, the community input response is minus one and then zero all the time thereafter, and then on impact minus one. So this is a one, and it tells you one is all the output that was lost over the cycle. Okay. Now let me show you the the case of durables, which I think, and, and then we can stop and ask questions, and uh, and uh, because the contrast is the interesting thing. If you look at a durables demand shock instead, now again you have a minus one percent drop in durables, but then durable expenditures boom during the recovery in the next period and then come back to steady state, and output again now collapses by minus one percent, then booms and then goes back to 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 steady state. And this reversal, this strong reversal in, in, in output is what we're going to call, uh, and in durable expenditures, what we're going to call pent up demand. And this is a case where the recovery looks zeta shaped instead of V shaped and, and is boosted by, by pent up demand. And, uh, and what is intuition for why this happens in the model is that when you think about the consumer that cuts, so it's saying, oh, I, I have this shock, I don't want to buy durables today. So then it cuts the durable expenditures. Now, this means that they enter the next period with a depreciated stock of durables. Because you know, this was a car that you didn't take to the repair shop, and hence over the next period, it depreciated a bit. So then your car is, is a bit worse in terms of your, your consumption flow. And, uh, but now next period, they enter with this depreciated stock of, of durables, and the consumer on average would like to have some durable consumption in the long run. So then in order to come back to that desired level of a durable uh, consumption, it needs to spend more than average to replenish the depreciated stock of durables. And that's the boom that we see here in, in durable expenditures. And, uh, and hence, because expenditures then equal output, then output booms as well, uh, because of this precisely this, this notion of, of pent-up demand for durables, which is, which is here. So how does the 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 this object this normal asking input response look in this case well it looks very different so you have minus one on impact same as before that's the output loss but then you recover one minus delta during the period t equals one so then the normal asking input response is just delta in this case and where it was one if you remember for the case of a, of a service shock and delta is a number that is going to be relatively small so 0 0.06 Meaning that in the sense of what is the output loss in this case is, 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 is much smaller uh, uh, during, this, during this cycle. Any questions about this? So, so going back to the, the, the non-homotheticities, if you had like services into like luxury and non-luxury stuff, and you might think like, yeah. you know, during the COVID crisis, people moved away from, from non-luxury, I mean, from luxury services, and you know, they just wanted to buy more, more, more food or whatever because they had to cook at home. Mm -hmm. Then you might think that you know the share, and because the income, you know, got lower, so so they're going to spend relatively more on that for a while, and that could sort of yeah. uh, shrink the sort of pent up demand from the durable side, right? Because as a share of expenditure, durables are just going to be lower for a while, and that's Absolutely. okay because you know they know how much it is going to shift that share. Absolutely. Yeah. Even even with unknown homotheticity, the case where you don't have separability, or the case where you don't have fixed prices, you would also have a, a connection between the service expenditures and durable uh, expenditures in the economy. This is kind of a, a special case where the two the economies behave as if they were kind of like durables only or, or services only, and uh, for these two for these two shots. So yeah, and um, but we'll talk about we'll go away from that special this special case in in a couple of slides. And uh, even sorry, and then if you have a negative demand shock, this BC business, then even then now you have a, 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 a this affects both uh, both type of consumption, and this is a case where you are somewhere in between the two extreme cases that I showed you before. So the input response is good. That depends on the the share of durables, the expenditure share depends on the discount factor, and and, and whatnot. Uh, okay. Any more questions? Yes, uh, Martin. Yep. Yes, hi, Martin. I'm Andres Fernandez here. Um, so, just this is more like a clarification question. So, 
one often hears the argument that faced with the uh, income shocks, households are gonna cut back more on durable consumption. Mm -hmm. uh, and hence you would expect in recessions to see a, uh, a stronger downturn in that type of uh, consumption. Yep. You, you are pushing uh, against this idea, right? You're pushing back. No, not really. No, so, so that's or, what I what I said before. This is here. It's just that it's hidden a bit. So you know that. So you're absolutely right that for a for a given magnitude of the shock, then a durable response of say to a negative demand shock should be larger than the one for services. Here, that if you look at that, like minus 0 0.5, minus 0 0.5. That's it. But you're right that this one should be say minus one and this one minus 0.5. This is on purpose. We constructed the shock in a way such that the impact response is always normalized to minus one. And, and remember, that was the reason was that we because we wanted to focus on on the shape and not so much on the scale. But in practice, when you the both would change when you have a more durable or a more service shock and, and durable shock. So, sorry, so that's here. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, but. But in a way, what you're also uh, adding to this uh, story is that, okay, it can be true that whenever a, a recession comes, I cut back more consumption on durable goods. So I, I go about without uh, buying that car or that refrigerator. Yeah. But I will, I will eventually compensate for that uh, uh, reduction in consumption. That, that is Correct. what you're pushing for. Okay, so yeah, that's eventually that's, I, the will, reverse I will is also buy gonna more be cars and will buy more refrigerations than I would have otherwise done. Correct. Ex okay. uh, in the, you know, do it while things, when things are bad. You just postpone this consumption for later. Yes, that's the, okay. that's the idea of that demand. Whereas you don't do that for services and, uh, or non-durables. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, uh, may, okay. may I say something quick on this? Yeah. I'm not super clear, so uh, in my mind. So, but it seems to me that the type, the the strength of the shock that you need to engineer a decrease in uh, actual real demand of durables and services is different. So, yes. if if really uh, agents want to smooth consumption, then you need to engineer a very relatively big shock on demand in order to engineer the minus one. But in the case yeah. of durables. Is that Smart. shock has to be smaller. So in Sorry. some sense, it's a little bit an unfair. Comp I mean, I find it uh, very pedagogical, but in the other, in, in a different uh, front, it's a little bit unfair comparison because you won't see in the data that many big shocks on services to engineer a decrease in one percent. In one percent, but you can see very often uh, demand shocks on durables to see in the data and uh, minus one percent. Absolutely. Yeah, no, you're right. And, uh, and then that's going to come later. So this is, again, this is a, an instructive example, I would say the, but the thing, the, the first thing I would say is that we, we don't know what the magnitudes of these shocks are. We just don't observe them in reality. What, so what I mean to say, let's see, what we were interested in is something that we could observe and saying, look, we are right now in the midst of the recession and the recession has been minus 1%. Now that's what we saw output collapse by this much. And let's imagine that there was some demand shock that caused this. And the question is comparing two different types of recessions that what we're seeing is that of similar magnitude, let's say, you know, the COVID recession versus an average US recession, uh, let's say the Great Recession, similar magnitude overall, but very different compositions of spending. That's what we're observing in real time. What would you expect the recovery would look like after these two types of, of recessions? And the answer to that question needs to control for the, for the severity and the composition. That's absolutely a different question than saying, if I have a model where I fix a given volatility of the shocks and I change the, the long run shares of this economy, what is going to happen to the volatility and the persistence and whatnot? Because there you would change both the amplification and the persistence at the same time. So, so yeah. Uh, good. Okay. So then uh, if you have uh, now, so now let me extend this. So let's say let's have any combination of the three shocks together, add up all the input responses. And I don't know what generated the recession. It's just some combination of these demand shocks. 
And let me define one object, omega, which is going to be the services share in total consumption uh, declines. So what this is saying is, this is something actually that is computed empirically, I'm, I'm going to do so. This is just asking a question, if consumption dropped by 2%, what percentage of that corresponded to the, to the decrease in services versus non durables And if services is 1%, then this number would be 0.5. So half of the total decline would be uh, accounted for by, by the services uh, uh, sector. And, uh, and then in this case, then we can already, you know, ex kind of extend this logic to, to an arbitrary uh, shock composition and an arbitrary services share. And what you find is the kind of the main result of the paper, which is that this object, the normalized community input response is larger, the larger the services share is. And or in other words, that the, the larger the services share of the recession omega is, then the weaker the recovery is. The reason being that pent up demand is going to be weaker and the economy is going to look more like the orange line compared to the blue line. Uh, sorry, the green line. And uh, so you're going to be some, for some arbitrary combination, you're going to be somewhere in between those two, those two input responses. Uh, okay. And, uh, and, and that's the result and, uh, and uh, the, the main result. And the question is now, well, if we move away from this special case, how general is this? To what extent that this, this logic of, of weaker beta demand and weaker recoveries uh, survive? And uh, that's what we're going to do next. And, uh, and uh, we're going to do it in steps. We're first going to keep two simplifications, which is still separate preferences. And I still assume that monetary policy is passive in the sense that it fixes the expected real rate or equivalently, like equivalently that prices are fixed and the nominal rate is fixed. Uh, but we're going to allow for persistent shocks and adjustment costs. Okay. And th that's, that's the, and, uh, and it turns out that the result in this case, even in this case, the result does not necessarily survive. So it is already the, it is possible that even when this pent up demand logic for durables is there, then if adjustment costs are strong enough, then this completely reverses the logic by which, yes, I want to go out and spend like crazy in the, in the recovery and buy my car that I didn't buy before, but also I find it very hard because I have large adjustment costs. And in, the, in that case, you may even see that, that the responses of durables are smaller than the responses of, of services in the, in the recovery. And you see this very clearly in the extension of this expression that I had before for wh where you, now you have this object theta here that captures the re lag response, the, the durable response to lag durables, and, uh, uh, and uh, which is an eigenvalue here. And this eigenvalue could be such that, that, the, that the, it even tells you that omega, uh, uh, that, that this object actually decreases with omega instead of increasing. Now, I don't find that proposition particularly helpful because it's in terms of objects that I cannot ob observe, like the, the persistence of the shock, the, the, this eigenvalue business. I would need a model and we're going to do so. But what we're going to do is instead come up with a necessary and sufficient condition that is in terms of measurable objects. And those are the following. So it's going to be thinking about an eigen demand shock. And then we're going to be thinking about the normalized cumulative input responses of services and, and durables. Instead of just the output one, these are the equivalent ones, but for services and, and durables. And, uh, and what we're going to, what you can show is that given any combination of shocks, of course, not just the aggregate demand shock, then this um, normalized cumulative input response of output is increasing in the services share, meaning that recoveries are weaker, the larger the, the services share if and only if you can rank these normalized community input responses. And so that the services one is always above the durables one. And what that guarantees is that the pent up demand effects dominate the adjustment cost in the, in the, in the model. But this is in terms of, of these objects that we can measure in the data and we're, we're going to do so. Okay. Any questions about this? And uh, all right, so that's the result. This tends to extend to economies with incomplete markets, where you have a kind of a tank model with half of the households are hand to mouth. If you, if you have many sectors instead of just two uh, with different durabilities and adjustment costs, same thing, uh, a version of that extends there uh, to, to that case. If we had supply shocks instead of demand shocks, now there's gonna be shocks to relative productivity of the two sectors, so the relative prices can shift around. 
same same thing applies. And uh, and importantly, if you have general adjustment costs, not just quadratic, so that you have an arbitrary lag uh, structure on the adjustment cost, this result applies too. And let me add another one here that, that actually relates to the question by Ernesto, which is if you had thick information, which is one way that people have looked at trying to get at the ham shapeness of the response, the result still uh, still applies to that economy. And I'll come back to the question of general adjustment cost uh, when, when we do some of the, the empirics. Why this is important in in uh, in uh, in um, because that's, there's kind of a discussion in the literature, what is the, the type of adjustment cost that we should be having and why you generate this hump shameless uh, or not. And, uh, and uh, so I'll come back to this. Okay. And then what does, where does the result not extend to? Well, it turns out that it does not extend when you have, that the two sectors are, are very entangled. So when you have separability, no separability, sorry, when you have partially sticky prices or and an active monetary rule. Uh, in this case, what happens is that then you have an additional persistence that's happening through the effect of past durable purchases on sorry, past durable stock on current services, either through the non-separability or to the effect of inflation. And in this case, then this expression looks like this, where you have an extra term over here that has to do with the effect of durables on, on services. And it's possible that then the condition that I showed before is only necessary and it's no longer sufficient for the, the ranking of the input response is not sufficient for the result that recoveries are weaker after more services uh, bias recession. And, um, and uh, no, there's some cases where you can sign this if you put some, some parameters, for instance, when you have substitutability in the goods, which I think is a big irrelevant case, in fact, what, we, you know, what we've seen, then, uh, then this result actually gets stronger. So the result is both is the, 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 the condition is also sufficient, but in general, it may not be. Uh, now it turns out that we're going to do this numerically. And we do find that for a wide range of calibrations where the condition falls, even if it's not sufficient, it turns out that in practice, you still get that recovers are weaker, the, the larger the service is share. And that's, that's a quantitative statement. Uh, so, so yeah. And so it seems to be because the condition is that look the input responses models that match these input responses will necessarily feature this uh, 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 stronger pent up demand for durables, and and, and that's what I'm going to show you next. In fact, any questions about this? No. Okay. Let's get to the measurement then. Uh, so the hypothesis then that comes out from, from this class of models is that spending cuts in a demand driven recession that are more concentrated in services will lead to a recovery that is hampered by weaker pent up demand. And we derive a test for this, which is a ranking on these normalized cumulative info responses to an aggregate demand shock. The question is, okay, how do I measure an aggregate demand shock in the data? And uh, it turns out that the way we constructed the shocks they work exactly the same as a monetary policy shock in the model. So a monetary policy shock is equivalent to an aggregate demand shock in terms of the input responses. And uh, unfortunately, we also have a relatively standard, you know, relatively standard approaches to identifying this type of shocks. And uh, so we don't really have to argue about whether the identification so much and can just focus on the, on the input responses. We're gonna do one, which is a simple recursive VR identification. We try the others. And, and and they will also work uh, well. So I'll, I'll show you the this one today. And uh, and if you don't like more type policy shocks in the paper, we also have other shocks to aggregate demand, like uncertainty shocks. And also we look at um, the reduced form shocks themselves that are not structural. Uh, and, and we actually get similar results too. So those are in the paper. Okay. And uh, all right, so these are how the input responses uh, look like uh, in this case. These are the input responses of durables, non-durables, and services to this monetary policy shock. And again, I'm always normalizing the impact response to to minus one to be able to focus on on the shape. And uh, and and what you see is something that qualitatively actually looks very similar to even the simple model the, that I showed you before. So you see this the durables fall and then they overshoot, whereas for non-durables and services, this overshoot is not there and it looks more like a V. And this one looks more like the zeta. And non durables are somewhere in between, given that actually it includes some semi durables like clothing and whatnot. 
and uh, and if you do the test and you compute the normalized cumulative input response, it turns out that the services one is 88% larger than the durable one, precisely because of this strong uh, reversal that, that we see here. And then, and, and in some sense, there's the sense in which it is not new, the durables uh, overshoot has been documented by McKay and Villan and by Ersek and Levine before then to a monetary policy shock. And what we are adding, I guess, is the comparison to the non durables and services uh, responses and then connecting that to uh, to the test of, of pent demand via the, the community input response. Martin, there is a question yep. from the from from one attendee. Sophia, could you open yep. the mic, please? Or Jorge? I need to open them the mic. Yes. Uh, so one uh, one sec, please. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Martin. How are you? Jorge Hello. here. Um, well, it, I, I wrote in the chat, uh, it's, it's basically just trying to rule out supply side uh, channels. Do you check that, uh, that the effect is stronger for non-tradable services, which depend more on local demand? Because if you think of tradable services have a more diversified set of customers. Uh, so excellent question. Uh, I have something on that uh, a bit later. So, and uh, I, I like this question. And I don't like it. So I like it because it, so I don't like it because the model is a uh, close economy. So it's hard for me to speak to kind of an open economy with what I have shown you. Yet, there is an extension of this model that we have not done, but I think it's the next paper perhaps on uh, when you have an open economy and there the, you have an additional way that things may work that even if the, even if say, two economies have a similar expenditure share in terms of services and durables. Some economies may be exporter of durables and other ones may be exporter of services. And then the demand may leak out in that case, the demand for that would have owned to durables in the, in the close economy, it may leak out if they're, for instance, you're importing the durables. And, uh, and, uh, and that's kind of known in international business cycles the initial of leakage of demand. And here it comes back with a vengeance, you know, saying that it's not only the demand that may leak out, but even the pent of demand. And uh, that is, and then it's not only, this is not only matter for the amplification, but also for the persistence of, 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 uh, of recoveries in economies that are more open and, and are durable exporters versus durable importers or services versus, versus durables. And, um, and I'll show you something on the data across states uh, later on where they, I look at non trade services. Uh, but not here. I didn't. I, we didn't look at that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, um, okay. Good. Um, then uh, you may worry that you know maybe okay, these are may very aggregated sectors, in particularly for in particular for for COVID. You may you know there's this idea. I never heard of memory goods until COVID. So there's this small literature on memory goods. And uh, this idea that some services may actually act like durables because what you're consuming is not, you know, you want a vacation and what you consume is not a vacation itself, but the flow of memories that you get over your lifetime. And uh, I, I, I find an interesting topic, more micro-ish, it's not a lot on it. And, uh, but you may worry about that then that some categories that we're all having this, you know, pent up demand for going out, going on holidays or, or, or restaurants or whatever. And, and the question is whether that's there in the data. So far, my prior is that no. So if you look at things like recreation services, food services, in the past, at least we have not observed the strong pent up demand for you know your run of the mid recession in this case generated by a by a monetary shock. Uh, uh, but you still do see for th things like recreation goods, furniture, uh, and the like. Uh, so, you know, my prior is that maybe we will go back and, and do, you know, go to a couple of restaurants, go on a holiday, but it's not like we're going to fully compensate for all the restaurants and all the holidays that you didn't say during, during all these periods. This may be different in this, in this recession. I don't know, but given the evidence so far, I am a bit skeptical. And, uh, and, uh, and also given some previous work by High and Kruger and Postawai, where what they find is consistent with this, that durable goods, you know, depreciation rate is pretty small, whereas 
this type of memory goods that they classify, the depreciation rate is something like two thirds over one year. So pretty fast depreciation. It looks more like a clothing than or than a, than a furniture or recreation goods. Uh, uh, but yeah. Okay. Good. So then, uh, so that that's one piece of it. So then, what this is saying is that then this condition passes, and then you no, know, then the implication of of of, of rec for recovery follows. But that's not a direct test of the of the mechanism. It, uh, it's a test of me test of the mechanism, not the prediction. We could do something for, to test the prediction directly, which is look at across states in the U.S. Unfortunately, there's not enough variation in the in the time series in the U.S. to uh, to be able to to tell. Although some anecdotal evidence goes in line with the prediction, like recessions like the 1960, like the one in the late 1970s, the oil uh, 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 during the oil crisis, the monetary recessions in the early 80s, the recovery after the World War II, those were all very durable recessions and very quick bounce back. And uh, and we'll see what happens with COVID, which is really one of the first services, very service intensive recession. But if you look across states. We actually have much more variation, and in fact, there's a nice paper by Olney and Pachidi where they did look at this, and they do find that employment recoveries are longer in when states provide more services compared to goods. And this goes back to the question that that, that was just here, and uh, and we re simply we did this exercise measuring the objects the way that we have in the theory, which is normalized community pool responses and services share of the recession. And here I'm really using the share of non-tradable services, precisely because that's where you would expect the demand to be, not just services that are tradable. And this is the normalized community input response. And you do see that the prediction seems to be there that when states have recessions that are that are more concentrated in non-tradable services, then the normalized community input response over the next 12 months is larger, so that the recovery is weaker. Uh, so that's I think a nice, a nice, uh, no, a nice. Uh, Consistent with the with the prediction of, of of the of the model. Okay. Good. All right. So let's turn to quantification then, since since I have have like half hour left, right? That's uh, yeah. Okay. Good. Yes. And uh, so so then, as I was saying, so there's two main reasons why there may be variation in demand composition. The first one is that even if I fix and I get demand shock, maybe the long run shares across economies are different, and they are in the data. Uh, even within developed economies, if you go across developed economies, I couldn't have found good data. If anyone has good data on that, uh, please tell me. But within OECD economies, uh, say the USA, kind of like the USA compared to Canada, Canada is a much more durable, intensive economy compared to say the, to the USA, and um, Ru and also the USA is a very service int intensive comp economy compared to a uh, place like Russia. And uh, so the question is, what are the effects of these changes in long run shares? for for the for the recovery dynamics. The second one is that even if the shares are fixed, what happens when you have different recessions driven by different combinations of sectoral and aggregate demand shocks? And to get an idea of what is the, you know, the possibility, uh, the type of magnitude that we see across recessions in spending composition, here I'm plotted the COVID-19 recession, which is essentially a services recession, where, where this is the, the contribution of services to the total consumption change during the recession, peak to trough. So it's the same omega object that I showed you before. Basically, COVID-19 is all in services. Average recessions tend to be more durable recessions, precisely because of the larger amplification and, and the temporal substitutability of durable. And some recessions are very durable compared to the average, like the old crisis uh, is one, the 1980, early 80s crisis is another one, and then the World War II is another one. And, and so that where, where this, this year is very large. So we're gonna to get at this, you know, this might just give us kind of an idea of what is the possible uh, change in the mag composition that we, that we could expect. And uh, and we to get at this question, we're gonna follow two approaches. The first one is I like quite a bit because it's very transparent and it's very easy to implement and it has some advantages. So the first one is a semi-structural shift share. And uh, and what we're gonna do, so the goal is to construct, you know, we have these input responses here that I show you. And this you know, was associated with a particular spending composition given for that the, the average monetary policy shock. And what I would like to do is construct a counterfactual economy where I change the not just the monetary policy shock, but I either change the shares or change the the sectoral incident of the shock to change the demand composition of the economy and see how aggregate output dynamics change. 
And what you can do, something naive, but tends to work out in some cases, is to just take those sectoral input responses to a monetary shock and then reweight them to match any desired sectoral spending composition. Okay. And uh, and that's gonna give you a counterfactual aggregate consumption uh, input response. And with that, you can construct then the cumulative input response and whatnot. Okay, you say, well, you're crazy, Martin, this will never work. Well, it turns out that you will recover the true output input responses in a special case of the model where the separability, passive monetary policy, and the demand shocks are as persistent as the monetary policy shock that generated those responses. And uh, and this works for either source of variation, either the long run shares or the changes in the shock combinations. And uh, and I like this doing this because the the first it's very easy to implement. And even if you don't know how to write a model, but you write, know how to run a VR, you can do this. But the second reason I like it is that it, it is restrictive in this sense, but it leaves a lot of the other parts of the model unrestricted, like how it, what is the exact nature of seeking information? What is the exact nature of adjustment cost? All those things don't really matter for, uh, 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 sorry, they matter for the responses, but as long as those models could match these responses, you would get the right response. So if you ask me to predict, I will use this instead of a model where we know like you know, McKay and Will and, and whatnot, other models, they, those models have a hard time in matching both the amplitude of the cycle at, where the peak happens here and the, the hump shapeness of, of the responses. And uh, so, you know, the, the, those are the, those are the trade-offs I would say, living, living. And I, I would find say the adjustment cost is something that, that worries me more because I really don't know how those look like uh, or seek information or people process information. I really don't know how those look like. Um, so that's, that's one thing. And um, okay, so then if you do that, let me, yeah. So if you do that, then this is what you get, for instance, when you change long run shares in the economy, expenditure shares for an aggregate demand shock, it turn, and you compare an economy like Canada with high durable share versus the USA, then the normal community input response is about 15% smaller uh, than, than the US share. So Canada would have uh, stronger recoveries because it's a more durable uh, intensive economy. More interestingly and start perhaps is, is what, you ha what happens when you change the combination of shocks that hit the economy and, and in this case, sorry, I'm not changing the combination of shocks. I'm literally just changing, reweighting these input responses to match an arbitrary composition of the oil crisis, the average recession, or the COVID-19 recession. And here you get the full, how the input responses of a consumption look like, and an output in the in this in this case too in the, in the model. When you do that, and then it turns out that when you reproduce the COVID-19 shares, then the input responses are much more persistent making the normal community input response 70% larger than than an average recession. And uh, so you see you there see the, the much weaker reversal that uh, the in, in the case of, of of a recession that looked like uh, like COVID in terms of the demand composition. Okay. Any questions about this? Okay. Um, all right. So then the second approach is a much more standard thing. Let's say that I just take my, the, the full model that I, that, that with, with adjustment costs, sticky prices, the monetary policy rule, adjustment costs and whatnot. And, uh, and I just calibrate it and, 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 and produce counterfactuals. And it turns out that we again, robustly find that the, the, the recoveries are weaker in the sense of the community input response. The larger the, the share of the, of services in the in the recession, and what we can do in the model is kind of do some sensitivity analysis to see uh, even when the our testable condition that holds but is not sufficient whether we still get the the same prediction. And the answer is yes, by by and large. Here I'm plotting, for instance, the the a graph where you have the slope of the nucleation Phillips curve and adjustment cost here, and we're comparing the normalized community input responses of a COVID-19 shares recession versus the average recession. For our preferred calibration, it turns out that the, there's a similar magnitude that the shift share, that's just by coincidence that you know, they turned out to give you something like 70, 90% larger uh, community input responses for a more services-led recession. 
And even when you crank up sticky prices or you make adjustment costs very large, much larger than anything that you could find in, in any reasonable parameterization, you still get that the input responses are just so different than the that the the services share that 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 economies with the larger services share in the recession are uh, have weaker recoveries as well. And um, uh, so yeah, so it seems to be pretty robust uh, implication of, of our models to, that as long as you have responses that look like the ones that I show you here, and and that's that's kind of the. The, the test. Of course, if you if you have a response that looks differently, where the durables one would be below the services one, then the the it's fully reversed. And theoretically, you can get that. For instance, if you crank up the the non separability enough, and you make them very complements, you can get that. If you crank up the adjustment cost way beyond this, you can get that too. Actually, so in the limit, if you if you make them the rows cannot adjust, of course you get that. Uh, but then you would be those would be counterfactual with respect to what we observe in the data. Uh, okay. Any questions about that? No. Okay. Good. And uh, so then, so let me turn to then policy, the, the the monetary policy implications, given this relatively large effect of demand composition that we found. And uh, so the first exercise is again imagine an economy that is just driven by demand, aggregate demand shocks, but we can ask the question of how should central banks behave? Should they behave differently as economies become more and more service intensive? And uh, and the answer in this in the it's very stark in it's this is kind of an edge edge result, but that I think illustrates a more general principle. So the answer in this model is that optimal monetary policy is completely independent of the services share when the economy is only hit by aggregate demand shocks. And remember, I showed you before that. The input responses to an aggregate demand shock do change when you change the services share of the recession. This was the whole talk was about how the economy look, the recoveries look different, more persistent, the, the larger the services share. Yet, this has no implication for the kind of optimal monetary policy. So it is not the case that, for instance, if optimal monetary policy need to cut interest rates by one percent and then and then have some some comeback, that path of interest rate is exactly the same regardless of the services share. So why is that? It's kind of a counterintuitive. So the reason is that, well, that once you have more services in intensive economies, this changes the transmission of aggregate demand shocks. That's, that was the whole talk. But it also changes the transmission of interest rates at the same time. And, and in this case, they are exactly equally affected, precisely because we constructed the aggregate demand shocks to be identical to monetary policy shocks. And uh, so what this is saying is that, yes, it is true that when you have an, an aggregate demand shock, then the economy will collapse. And then if the service is more intensive, uh, the economy is more service intensive, the recovery will be, will be slower. But in turn, when the monetary policy reacts optimally to that, it is also true that the same cut in interest rates and the same path will also, when you have the more service in in intensive economy, you have less amplification initially, and also you have less missing pent up demand exposed when you brought the demand forward. And uh, this is a bit knife edge, and I think it holds exactly here. And uh, it speaks to though to the results in McKay and Villain a bit, where in their in their world where they're thinking is, oh look, for a, if I have a more durable economy, then a cut in interest rates brings demand forward. And what this is saying is, yes, hold on, it is that is true, but monetary policy never happens in the in the vacuum. It is always responding to some shock, and hence. Even even though for a given monetary policy shock the responses change, for the conduct of monetary policy that is trying to offset some shocks to the extent that the transmission of both are equally affected, then maybe there's no implication of a more durable sort of services uh, intensive economy. And and this has also the more general principle is this, and I'm a senior here too. I've written papers like this, so I've written papers that that have the following template, and uh, and there's a lot of papers along those lines. You have a model where, and you're studying the, tra the transmission of monetary policy in that model. You add a mechanism and then you say, oh, look, the transmission is weaker or amplified of monetary policy shocks. And then, and then you compute those things and, and, and make your case. And, uh, but I think we never do the, we seldomly do the exercise where you say, look, if that, if that 
additional mechanism that you're including in your model is also changing the transmission of the shocks themselves that the monetary policy is trying to offset, then maybe there's no implication for optimal monetary policy, even if the transmission of mo monetary policy in the vacuum changes. And uh, that's the more general principle, I would say, the, of this, this clean example that is here. So, so some food for thought. Martin, um, Martin can you yeah. jump in? Uh, yeah. next so I think that uh, this is an uh, interesting result. And I think, as you mentioned it, it depends on thinking about aggregate demand shocks. Uh, is you, are, you are changing the BC monetary policy is something that are, is akin of an aggregate demand shock. So that's why the composition doesn't matter for monetary policy, but it will matter if uh, you're not thinking about the BC, you're thinking about one of the sectorial demand shock. And I also think that it won't matter if there is, um, sorry, it, it will matter again the composition for monetary policy at the zero lower bound. At the zero lower bound. So the first thing that you said is definitely true. That's the next result. Let's talk about that in a second. For the zero lower bound, there, again, for an aggregate demand shock, I'm not so sure because I need to think a bit more. But one of the examples, the special case of the economy, which is fixed prices and fixed nominal rates. So that looks like the zero lower bound, whether we fix prices. Now, without fixed prices, then maybe there's something else going on. But to the extent that you, prices are relatively fixed and then you have a, a zero lower bound, then this result still holds because that looks like the zero lower bound. But without fixed prices, it may not. I agree. I need to think about that. And uh, it definitely does not hold. And in the case where it's not an aggregate demand shock that you're trying to offset, you're trying to offset the, the sectoral shocks. And uh, so here you can ask the question of how should central banks respond to a more services led recession, like COVID 19, let's say, because the particular shock that hit the economy was more service biased. And here you get the intuitive answer, which is that now the, the central bank should is for longer if the recession is more biased towards services because of the, of the shock. So it's no longer independent of the services share of the recession, as, as you were anticipating in Nestor. And, uh, and, uh, and the idea is precisely because they anticipate that the recession is going to be uh, more protected, and hence they want to use for longer as well to, to accommodate that. Um, yeah. So it's just a matter of persistence of the response to monetary policy. It's not a matter of, uh, ex of how strong it has to be on impact. No, that, just that's persistence. true. That's true. So that's true, but again, in this case, we're always doing the, so in, in this world, monetary policy can always undo the whole recession. It has full power to, and, and hence it can always target any impact decline. And, and the question is, once I have upset the recession, then just with the, suppose I do it naively, I think that the recession is going to be purely, so fully, it's going to fully revert like in next quarter. Uh, so very transitory. And I can always offset that. And then the question is, well, given that, should I do it a bit for longer or not, if I expect that, that the recovery is going to be weaker? And, uh, yeah. um, uh, okay, good. And uh, so the, then, good. So we'll have some time for questions at the end. So let me just conclude and give you one quick takeaway uh, for, for central banking. And maybe we can talk about other forms of stabilization policy too. So I think what I'm sure is that when you combine some very basic consumer theory of pent up demand with output being demand determined, then that directly all, then you need to accept that demand composition matters for the, the strength of recovery. So those are the two things that you need. And, uh, and there's a key test implication of this, which received strong support in the US time series, this idea of ranking the input responses. We show you that this is also relevant quantitatively for the type of magnitudes that we have seen uh, in variation in demand composition. And then I'll show you some implications for optimal stabilization policy. And one you know, takeaway, if you want, for a central bank right now, and I think, of course, central banks and feds have been talking to in, in, in some places, they're definitely thinking about this. And uh, where if a central bank mistakenly took this current recession as a run of the mill recession where pent up demand effects are stronger, then they would hike rates too fast precisely because they don't anticipate that the recovery is not going to be buffeted by, by pent up demand. And, uh, and, and, but if they understand that the composition has changed and this is going to have an effect, then they're going to do, then, then the optimal thing is, is achievable. And so, yeah, that's all I have. Thank you very much. And, uh... Great. Thank you very much, Martin. So if you have any questions, please 
open your mic and and just ask. Uh, I have a question, Andres Fernandez again. Yes, so, okay. um, so Martin, one one um, question regarding uh, the implications for the recovery, uh, drawing from the the precise case of Chile. Here, what we have had is uh, actually a boom in consumption of durable goods, mainly mm -hmm. because of uh, a policy that allowed people to withdraw early uh, their pension funds. So what you have mm -hmm. seen is a uh, durable consumption that uh, compares to Christmas uh, for <laughs> a few months. Uh, so looking back at the uh, IRFs that you showed, um, one could, uh, and doing some extrapolation of, of your, uh, the key implications of the model, one could, uh, foresee that the recovery uh, is going to be quite subdued relative to previous dis uh, recoveries. Um, uh, yeah, but the reason is, again, so, so it's absolutely true that, that uh, so it, and you're seeing this in other countries too, by the way, I've seen some data for Australia where the shock is kind of gone in some sense already, where retail and some durable expenditures are picking up and are kind of like overshooting. And uh, whereas the service is one and, and, and those ones yet not. And, but again, the reason, so this is kind of like the input response for that durable category. But then if what you need to do, remember, is offset, fully offset or fully compensate for the falling consumption in the recovery. So the shares of how much of the initial consumption decline was due to services versus durables, that matters. So what this is saying is that, so what you're saying and what we're seeing is yes, absolutely, people are buying a bit more cars, more, more furniture and whatnot. PlayStation, I bought a PlayStation at the beginning of the, of the, of the, of the, of, the, of COVID. And, um, but that accounted for a very small decline of consumption during the recession to begin with. Most of the cut was in restaurants, health and hospitality and whatnot. So you, what you need to do is compensate for those. And that type of expenditure will not recover as fast. And, uh, and we're not seeing that, at least what I've seen in the data that I've seen. And uh, yeah, it's like the mechanism is there. It, it's, uh, this is for durables, you do have the pent up demand. It's just that it accounts for a very small part of the overall consumption bundle that fell during the, during the recession. And, uh, yeah. but, but, okay, I, I don't recall uh, the extent to which in your calibration you have substituted substitutability between services and durable goods, but if yeah. there is a relatively high substitutability, uh, and I think that could be questioned, that, that could be argued against, but if there is such a thing, you, we wouldn't expect a recovery, a recovery at all, because we have already, I'm, I'm talking about the Chilean case, because we have had already a booming in, in durables, and yes, you had consumption of services that you uh, let go, Right, uh, you absolutely. Yes. Eventually, that consumption, and you basically you won't uh, you won't see a rebound of services uh, anywhere near what you would expect in an in an otherwise conventional recovery. Absolutely. So that's right. true. So, it, but so if you suppose that the subsidiary is very high, then that's an, a, a, a recession that looks like services cuts, but then durables actually boom on impact, and uh, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and then, uh, and that would be an extreme because even so, that's what that is telling is that because the the durables do boom on impact already, then actually you would have missing pent up demand during the recovery. So the sustainability, as I was saying before, it makes the things even worse for the recovery, which is I think what, what you're implying. These people that bought the car right now because they substituted away from services are not going to mm -hmm. buy that car four months from now, and uh, and hence you know, the recovery is going to be even weaker in that respect. And, and, uh, and they might not go to that restaurant after all. At, at, at that's, all that's e either. So it's that compounds. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Even e with separability, you have the, the result. And with substitutability, the result becomes even stronger. Now, in yeah. practice, I think that what you're saying, and I've, there's some stories and anecdotes for that for particularly good, particularly good categories. But in typical recessions, we do see this commitment of durables and, and, and services. 
And uh, so, I don't, so I think there's some sensitivity, but not so much in the aggregate, like, at a more aggregated level, and uh, where people tend to to cut both. But maybe for this shock that is very service intensive, maybe you do see it, and and uh, and it becomes more more similar. Here, for for the you know, run of the mill aggregate demand shock, is is not that substitutable at all. Yeah. And uh, on the data, um, there are other countries, Peru, uh, to name one that have uh, implemented similar policies. In, in the data of COVID that you have analyzed, ha have you um, seen countries where durable consumption has actually boomed and, and have you seen uh, any implication for services and, and the shape of the recovery or, or Is you have any no, so the, the only thing, so I've been looking at the data, I've been looking forward to the data coming out of Australia, which is a country that, you know, been without COVID for a while now, and and so the shock anticipated, which is what you want for, like, testing this, this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this story, and, uh, and so far, yeah, the durables have kind of, durables and retail, you, you see them have picked up quite a bit, and, 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 but the services so far, no, but the data for the last, Quarter has not been released yet, so I think it's really being released in like April or May. Uh, so we'll see what happens there. And uh, I, don't I know. think Chile, I think Chile is an even better laboratory. Okay, to test the type of thing. We, we can talk more. Uh, yeah, definitely. I didn't know about this policy that, that you're mentioning, where they allow people to spend uh, from their pensions, and that was only for durables, or it just happened that people spent on durables. No, it happened that people spent on durables because basically that's. Uh, pretty much all you can uh, you, exactly yeah so services was yeah. shut down to a large extent right no, that's a, yeah it's a good it's a good experiment um martin i have two yeah uh, i have two questions so i might have missed this from the presentation um so so one is do you do you do an extension which you allow for you know, uh, input output relationship across these sectors that could, you know, either ex uh, amplify or dampen your mechanism depending on the shares of those input output relationships. Not at all, and no, no, this is more of a of a <laughs> lack of skills on the part of the co-authors of this paper more than a, a lack of interest. I would say, yeah. Uh, okay. I, yeah. So I don't. I, I I think this would be very interesting. In fact, I presented this at the Monetary Economics and VR a couple of weeks ago, and Jen Jen Lau was presenting there one of her papers on networks. And uh, maybe, I mean, you guys, you and Ernesto probably know much better than I do. My impression from talking with them was that they really haven't seen kind of the the like the network structure, but the heterogeneity being described in terms of the durability of the of the different sectors, not just, you know, heterogeneity yeah. in terms of different sectors and the input output matrix. Uh, so I think that would be definitely something interesting to look at. In fact, I was talking yesterday with um, someone at the, at the Atlanta Fed and uh, where what they were, that's only, so he was telling me that for instance, some sectors like construction, they are very much, at least in the US, they're very much kind of uh, an input to a lot of other other sectors and uh, yeah. even services. So then you might think that then having, you know, the the input, whole input output uh, structure in in that respect, then even if they shocks out to the maybe to the uh, to the doable sector, that fits into the services one uh, as well. And uh, now of course this is empirically it's here in this in this input responses, but I would say it's interesting. It would be interesting to see what happens when you change the the input output structure and, and uh, what does that imply for say aggregate demand shocks through this same pet of demand channel yeah absolutely yeah okay and then and then the second thing i guess i also missed this before so sorry about that um, so is there is there any like inefficiency that the policy would like to sort of uh, um undo um or or uh, i mean besides the, the the adjustment frictions and so on uh, um, and so, and so, in that case, what will I mean? Uh, go, in going back to the initial question about the fiscal policy, which seems like a natural thing to think about in terms of where the fiscal policy should be allocated, uh, yeah. um, given this this mechanism. Um, and I would guess, you know, thinking about expenditures and durables or infrastructure would be kind of a natural thing. But I'm not sure whether that's consistent with the with the sort of all the ingredients yeah. you have in the theory. 
No, it is. It's, it's a good question. So the the reason inefficiency is the boring one, uh, the typical coming from sticky prices, and that's mm -hmm. that, that's it. The rest is everything else is efficient. the adjustment costs and everything else that that is not an inefficiency. It's just a friction. Yeah. It's not a source of inefficiency. And now um, there's a fiscal policy. So one that that is kind of uh, uh, that that will work well is actually uh, if you have a recession that is more services led because of the shock, then consumption subsidies for this type of uh, of uh, of goods may actually help in in quickening the the recovery. They work very much the same way as the as the interest rate pack. So you're always trying to reproduce this natural rate. You can do it with interest rates, but you could also do it with transfers and and, and, and some taxes uh, or subsidies. Uh, now, yeah, one of the problems with that is that, so in COVID, precisely what you don't want to do is to subsidize the consumption of the of the services. Uh, uh, so, so maybe the idea would be then to subsidize the 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 consumption of the durables, and uh, that which is that what people, even more than so than what people would like to. So th those are yeah. The, the, I haven't really explored them. Uh, that much. Chris actually has a paper on the equivalence, a new paper on the equivalence between transfers and and interest rates. Uh, uh, so that, that there's something there as well. But um, I don't think this is a very good framework to study optimal monetary policy, if I'm honest, or optimal stabilization policy, simply because the I find these distortions coming from sticky prices and the dispersion of prices is not the most relevant one. I would try. I would be more interested in seeing this in a in a heterogeneous agent model where the people are, you know, are borrowing constraint and hence like that's the main, the, the source of inefficiency comes from, from, uh, from the distribution effects of, of, of the shocks, not so much the, the price dispersion. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Any more questions? Um, here, Jorge again. Um, I want. I was thinking also, complementing Federico's uh, question. You have that. I mean, the input-output structure can affect the impact. Uh, maybe not that the persistency that much, but the investment network. Have you seen the paper by Thomas Winberry? Mm -hmm. So yeah. you got the construction, motor vehicles, uh, machinery are the investment hubs. They are the star suppliers in the investment network. So whenever investment just Recover these sectors are going to be the ones providing the investment goods. Yeah. So in that regard, Absolutely. that can really affect the persistence and might have might be related to what Federico was saying. Absolutely. Yes. And uh, now, so there's a very similar pent up demand logic for for capital goods, which are also durable. And uh, the reason we don't we don't focus on that for two reasons. The first one is in pre. So, so first of all, you can't. So even in a very simple model, the one like I show you, the one that I show you here, but instead of focusing on the doables, you would have say capital here, and then it enters into production. Even in that simple model, you lose the ability to characterize anything in, in closed form and have theorems and propositions and whatnot. You need to do everything in the in the computer. And uh, but the same logic applies when you when you solve the model there. However, the reason we don't focus on the pent up demand coming from investment, which in principle could be as important as the one coming from household demand is that empirically it seems to be much weaker. So if you look at these input responses for the case of, uh, so you, you suppose I had a fourth one, which was investment here. It does not look like the durable one at all. It looks much, it looks hand shaped a bit too, but then it kind of, it looks more or less like the services one or the non durable one. And to me, this is saying, yes, in principle, maybe a durable good is as long lived as a as a typical capital good yet the adjustment cost for investment and capital goods might be much higher than for a car and uh, and that's why that's my interpretation why in the input responses seem to suggest that the pent up demand is much weaker for for uh, for investment and hence that's why we we don't focus on that it's just a, it's an empirical and, uh, and this is known it's not i'm not making this up from our <laughs> From our input responses, I think it's actually in House and Basu, and also in Matthias and Vilan, they have these input responses there, and they just don't look. Uh, they, it just looks much weaker. I haven't ranked them, so something I didn't say. Sorry, in, before in the presentation, this may may have looked not as dark where you have the overshoot. It could have looked kind of, you know, 
still persistent, kind of like this with the with the V shape, but it's just that it's on always on top of the services one, and that would still work for the for the story that we're trying to tell. It's just that quantitatively, it, the, the magnitudes would be smaller because the input responses are a bit more similar, and the capital one looks like that. Uh, well, maybe the pent-up demand is there. I haven't formally tested the condition. Maybe we should. It's just that it just does not look that strong. So if you had a, you know, then the comparison would be two recessions, one that is more investment-led and one that is more, say, you know, other factors, say, like labor or, or consumption. And maybe the, the, the recoveries that you would expect from those two types of recession, at least through this mechanism, should not be that different. Thank you. Sorry for taking Any, extra time. Anyone else? No, no. <laughs> okay. Please, so, please, well, I, please. I've got a, uh, I've got a question. Please. Go ahead. Yes, Bahara. Well, uh, well, Professor Bahara, uh, I w in this, uh, I will take this as a question time to take a license. I only want to wish you and all the panelists and all the attendees a good Holy Week and a happy Easter. That's all. <laughs> Thank you, Erica. Thank you. Okay, so uh, with those happy wishes, we should uh, close the, the, the webinar. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming today. Thank you to uh, Martin. And uh, please stay tuned for the next Wednesday, 11.30 a.m. Chile time for our next webinar.